Welcome back to See You on the Other Side. I am your host, Leah, and I'm here today with our co-host, Christine. (laughs) Hi. And we have (laughs) Dr. Stephanie Coleman, a holistic medical practitioner. Um, Hi, Stephanie. Hi. How are you guys? We're great. We have so many questions for you today. Um, (laughs) I love questions. And I want to let our listeners know... Uh, a little bit about you and where you are. So if you could go into that a little. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I'm located in Los Angeles. I um, am kind of like a non-traditional physician, I would say. I was actually trained as a radiologist and I um, switched into psychedelic medicine probably about three years ago, um, just through my own work, personal work with psychedelics and just kind of what I believe is supportive for more holistic idea of health and wellness. Um, so yeah, I have a ketamine, a private practice, ketamine, ketamine practice here in LA, but also opening one in Salt Lake city. Ooh, exciting. When is that opening? Yeah. Uh, sort of this month. It's, okay. it's, <laughs> legally I can practice there this month. It's, um, just kind of finishing, putting the other pieces together and I have a partner there. So that's going to be working with me, which will be a lot easier. <laughs> Very nice. So what, um, if you don't mind me asking, how did you get into the psychedelic world? Um, yeah, I think it probably started with Burning Man. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a pretty big community of, of burners here in, in California. So having gone to that and then really just kind of doing my own research on it. So as kind of growing up on the East Coast, doing medicine, um, training on the East Coast, I was never really interested in drugs if we can we'll call them that so, um and then i really yeah had to kind of relearn what these drugs or medicines do and how they interact in the body so once i had a better understanding of what the reality was i was able to kind of feel safe exploring them um and then through doing my own work i got interested in the maps training for mdma Um, But it became pretty clear that they were going to be delayed longer than they were thinking it originally. So I had a friend who had done a ketamine training, and I really didn't know very much about ketamine at all. Um, So I went and did the training. And in the training, we do uh, two experiential components, like uh, both an intramuscular experience and a lozenge experience. And it was just really profound for me. Um, And it was really clear that that's just where I needed to be. I love that. I don't think I knew that you could do, take it orally. That's pretty awesome. Oh yeah. Ketamine can be, um, administered a lot of ways, (laughs) a lot of ways. Hmm. So in your practice, um, are you solely around like working with ketamine, um, or are you still doing some medical work, um, outside of ketamine? Um, my practice is just ketamine. Um, I still do some part-time radiology just because it's hard to let go of a skill that you took a long time to do. Um, but right now the only medicine I'm, I'm working with is ketamine. Uh, the goal I'm trained uh, as far as I can be in the maps MDMA training. I'm in CIS for essentially it's like psilocybin training. Um, so the the hope is that soon those drugs uh, will be available as well to work with. Um, So I'm keeping my fingers crossed for those. Yeah. So with your ketamine treatments, do all of your patients take it orally or is it infusion? How does that work? Yeah. So I don't do IV infusions. Um, I work with either intramuscular injections or lozenges, sometimes intranasal. Um, I tend to believe that this work is not one size fits all. It really has to be personalized to the the person you're working with and what they're coming to you with. So depending on what they're struggling with, whether it be depression, anxiety, trauma, depending on how severe they're struggling, what is their relationship to control? What is their relationship to um, anxiety and fear around the experience? What's their experience with psychedelics, sensitivity to medication, all of those things I take into consideration when I um, decide what route of administration we'll use for ketamine, but also what dose that we'll use. I predominantly do intramuscular, but um, when people are a little bit more fragile, we'll start with lozenges because they are an an easier takeoff. 
um, and usually not quite as deep for most people as the intramuscular sessions. We've talked to someone about ketamine before, but we, I mean, that was like our first experience ever hearing anything about it. And the whole time we were just like, what? Like had no idea any of this was a thing. Um, And legal. And legal. Like we had heard about ketamine as like a party drug. Um, Mm -hmm. And I mean, even like through us and our experience with psychedelics, like ketamine was like a no for me. And then talking Mm -hmm. to someone and hearing about the medicinal benefits and the healing benefits, I was like, oh, I was wrong. But I think that's what's so amazing is because there's like we are learning that there was a lot that we didn't know or we had misconceptions or um, oftentimes when people have used these psychedelics, the dosage was wrong. The intention was wrong. The Mm -hmm. setting was wrong. So they had a bad experience, but it can be a very beautiful and healing thing. And we didn't know that. Yeah. I mean, ketamine does have a bad rap because of its party scene. And because people know it as veterinary medicine as well, which it is, it it is used there. So everyone asks about the horse tranquilizer aspect. Um, And there's a stigma against synthetic medicines, right? So there's these believers of plant medicine versus synthetic and one is good and one is bad. Um, My argument to that is humans are part of nature and humans created these drugs. So it's still natural. And the fact that somebody can create these medicines where one like Adam is different, it's a completely different medicine is pretty phenomenal almost more phenomenal than the fact that someone figured out two plants go together to make ayahuasca. Um, so yeah, I think it does have that, that kind of negative sense where people are a little bit like put off by it or scared by it. And the fact that we categorize it as a dissociative anesthetic, right? So as soon as I say dissociation or dissociative, people are like, Ooh, especially in mental health, right? So when we think about dissociative disorders, there has this like, bad or like negative connotation again. So I tend to not use that word. What I, when I describe it, I talk about a, a maybe out of body experience or being unaware of your body. Um, but ketamine is really powerful medicine. And, and, you know, none of it's really about the drugs. These drugs are just a catalyst, right? They're not giving us anything. They're just allowing us to access what we already have inside of us. Yeah. And so when you start to talk about it in a way that isn't um, about the actual drug, there's this separation. Um, and ketamine has this really unique perspective is that when, when they're experiencing something in the journey, particularly when they're in the more out of body, um, part of the journey, it's unique in that it allows you to experience something where you're part of that experience, but you're also outside watching it. So it gives you the ability to have a different perspective. And that's really where I see ketamine be so powerful for people because, you know, as humans, we believe everything that we think is true. And if we're thinking it, it must be true. So, and if I can, I can tell you like, oh no, that's not true. This, you're this beautiful, amazing person. Everyone's like, oh yeah, great. Thanks. Sure. But I'm going to believe what I believe because I think that's true. What ketamine does is poke holes in that. So it allows you to have this little bit different perspective. And it's like, hmm, maybe everything that I thought isn't the only truth. And it sounds very like minimal and subtle, but it's a really big shift for people. And and that's where I, I I see the changes. It gives you this shift of perspective, which can be really powerful. I love that. So what kind of clients have you worked with? Anxiety, depression, all an array, I assume. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I mean, (laughs) I think it's never as simple as someone has one or the other. If somebody has you know, it depends on severity. So I'm not a psychiatrist. Um, so if somebody is really struggling and has a lot of severe uh, mental health struggles, maybe a lot of medications, I have a number of friends who are psychiatrists who also do ketamine that I'll refer people to. Um, I think as a physician, you should always know what you're good at and where your limitations are. And asking for help is, is an important skill as a physician. But a lot of who I treat are kind of very high functioning people, high functioning, very successful professional people who have some combination of of anxiety and depression. Anxiety, I'm seeing in everybody. I'm seeing anxiety in everybody. Part of that's a function just of our society. But um, very true. Yeah. yeah. But what I see is that these people have utilized their anxiety to become very successful, right? So they've they've managed to use that in a way that like they, they become doers, human doers, human beings, right? But what they tend to find out is somehow that's not making them happy. 
and where they struggle is in relationship, right? So like in relationship to self and therefore relationship to others. So, and when you don't have relationship and connection, you're probably gonna have some depression. So those things are all interconnected. Um, so really what I see that I'm working at is relationships. It's just being uh, ma not masked or it's just being shown in, in ways of depression and anxiety. But I do also see a lot of trauma. I think most women in general have some form of sexual trauma to varying degrees, um, which they may or may not recognize. Um, and then just trauma from life, literally. So you could say that almost everybody has trauma from the last three years. Because I just I, I talk about trauma in a more general sense, sort of like Gabor Mate talks about trauma as just wounding. And all humans have some type of wounding. So attachment trauma, which is going to lead to relationship <laughs> issues. Um, yeah, so those are, it's kind of a mix, but I would say anxiety is very prevalent and, um, some degree of trauma for sure. We were just speaking on this before you came on, um, how the word trauma scares so many people or it's such a big sounding word. Um, you know, I know I have trauma. Christine knows she has trauma from our childhood and, and, um, a lot of people who had these picture perfect childhoods or, or great parents or, or a successful life. Are like, I don't have trauma. And, and I, mm -hmm. I think that's so misguided the word itself. I think everyone has it and, and maybe mm -hmm. it's not as complex and maybe it's not as um, overt as childhood abuse or neglect or, you know, uh, sexual, sexual trauma or sexual yeah. abuse. Um, but I think, this is just something little, uh, something happened in first grade. And I can remember to this day, a friend in class, or he wasn't a friend, but somebody in class said something about me and it affected the way I was the rest of my life. Like worrying too much about what other people thought because this kid said something about the way he saw me. And well, the fact that you can remember it, right. Yeah. It's a very clear thing in your mind. How many years later? Yeah. Means that it, it was really, you were really affected by it. And I wonder how many things have happened that I suppressed because there are just a few little things I can remember that were, that were horrible, but every now and then I'll have a, a little flashback of something that I'm like, oh my God, did that happen? Or did I imagine that? Or did I dream that? So I think a lot of us do have some suppressed trauma or situations that affected us greatly that we don't think did. Mm -hmm. How do we... Yeah, I mean... Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you're, I think trauma too. Yeah. It's a very loaded word, right? And people are put off by it and don't want to associate with it. It means I'm broken, damaged, or it means my parents did something wrong or bad, you know, and that's why I always preference. I use it in a very loose way. And, and I like the idea that it just means wounding, right? Because all humans have some wounding because we interact with other humans who <laughs> not intentionally always will wound us. Yeah, like that first grader or that that kid when in first grade, he probably it was a flippant comment. He probably doesn't even remember it. I remember his name. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even go there for second grade and I remember this kid. Um, but I think the wound sounds a lot easier to digest, like wounding. Yeah. Everybody has wounding. Um, how do you mm -hmm. get someone to understand that that's what depression or anxiety stems from? I mean, I don't think we always have to understand it. So, you know, as humans, we have this need to understand everything, right? And that's part of the, the ego. I need to know what happened. I need to know why. Even when you are in a psych psychedelic experience, not everybody remembers everything, but they want to. And they have frustration around not remembering. And that's, in, in I just remind people, it's the ego that wants to remember. The subconscious has it. That's where this work is happening. You don't have to worry about it. So it's part of that need to control Right. So like, I need to know why it happened so I can fix it and what's going on. And it's it, part of the process is loosening up that we don't always have to understand it, but we have to have some acceptance around why we are the way we are. Some understanding about why we are the way we are. It doesn't have to be all of it. Um, and then knowing that like just that awareness can be enough of a first step. Right. So if we are not aware of something, we cannot choose or change it can choose differently or change it. Once we are aware, we have the option to start making different choices. 
Not that that makes it easier, um, but it gives us that option. And, you know, then you have to work on people with like who are wanting to always get things right and perfectionism in that way of control. And so that there has to be compassion, right? So it's awareness and self-compassion are really parts of how do we heal ourselves. And so letting go of the control, letting go of the right or wrong, the judgment. Yeah. And some people, you know, I didn't have, you know, perfectionism or OCD, but I grew up in an abusive home and I didn't know how to be any different with the way that I lived my life because those were skills of survival. And even, Mm -hmm. you know, talk therapy does help, but you got to go really consistently and go for a long time to, you know, maybe have a minimal difference because I didn't know how to be anything but. So with my mushroom journey, it was almost like I just did my first mushroom journey six months ago. Mm -hmm. And I have all of these puzzle pieces that I'm slowly putting together even still now. And it's not going back to an old self. It's creating a new me, a more authentic me, um, Mm -hmm. instead of going off of survival skills from when I was a little kid. So Mm -hmm. that's what I, yeah. I mean, I love parts work. If you guys have, um, knowledge around like internal family systems, go into it. Yeah. I want to hear more. (laughs) Tell me more. (laughs) Cause we talk about it. Right. So you just, were talking about parts and like, we talk about ourselves in parts like this, like a part of me wants to do this. A part of me wants to do that. A part of me feels this. So the parts work is, is not a new idea in kind of um, mental health or psychiatry, but Dick Schwartz is someone who has kind of branded the idea of internal family systems, having done a lot of family therapy work. And it's the idea that we kind of have this family inside of us. And so we have these parts and then there's this self energy. So the way I like to think about it in just kind of a broad sense in an easier way is that like when we're born, we're all born into this like self energy that has certain characteristics. We can't ever lose it. It's just who we are. But as we interact with other people, as things happen to us, we develop other parts that become protective of us, right? So in the way, the easiest way to think about it is pretty much everybody has a self-critic. It's the judgment of ourself, right? Most people have that to varying degrees. That is a part of us. It is not us. So at some point, maybe you were criticized or judged or something that hurt you. Mm -hmm. So you learned I'm not going to do that again. So I don't get hurt again. So this critic prevents you by criticizing you from doing something that might get you hurt. Now, at some point that was very protective, right? And that was useful. Usually these parts develop when we're young. As we get older, those parts don't serve us the same way. And so part of this work in psychedelics, and if you work with your different parts, it's that we don't get rid of these parts. We never get rid of parts. And there are actually no bad parts because they're just serving to protect us. Right. It's learning why are they doing that? And how do we rechange our relationship to them and give them a job maybe as a, when we talk about the critic, it's often how do we change it to be our cheerleader instead of our critic? Because all it wants to do is protect us. But how do we let it know that it doesn't have to do that anymore? Yeah. And I, um, kind of realized that when I got into a healthy relationship and I, I felt like I couldn't just let things go. I always had this defense mechanism that wasn't serving me. It wasn't serving the relationship. And then that's how I kind of got into psychedelics. So Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, yeah. So we, we kind of, I make fun of myself. We make fun of me because I'm like the witchy, wooey, hippie one. Um, and there, I am finding so many connections in, in language and the words that we use. So you're saying parts work. Um, and I have done some shadow work. But shadow work is mm-hmm. like a thing that probably scares a lot of people, the, the verbiage and, and that, that the way that I'm saying it. But it sounds like it's the same thing. Yeah. And so it, it's coming from a different background in psychiatry shadow work. Um, but the idea that we, the shadow just means a part that we're not acknowledging. It doesn't mean a bad part. A lot of people associate shadow with dark or evil or bad or something yeah. that like we've banished. And it doesn't actually mean that. It just means something that we haven't, we refuse to acknowledge about ourselves. Um, and so 
shadow work doesn't necessarily have to be hard and it doesn't have to be um, like grueling. I mean, I'll, work in general doesn't have to be hard, right? Like play and light is a breakthrough for people. But yeah, the shadow is a part of us that we are not acknowledging for some reason. So letting shining light onto the shadow by giving it awareness, getting to know that part allows us to form relationship with it so that we don't have to banish it. We can learn about it and then change our relationship to it. I see it as a, um, there was a part of me that was in survival mode. And when I came out of it, I was very angry with myself for not knowing and for not speaking up and for letting those things happen to me. And then I got to a place where I was able to thank myself and say, thank you for getting me through that. And Mm -hmm. you, you did a good job, you know, even though I know better now, I, I was almost like a, like, I've got this now. You did great. (laughs) Take a back seat and, and you can still live here. (laughs) I'm not Mm going to kick you out because I, I really appreciate what you did for me during those, all those years. And I love you for that. Thank you. So for me, that's shadow work. And, and I think can also be part work. I think that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what we do with our parts. We bring them up we, and we thank them because they've been doing a really good job. It's like that is their job, right, to protect. So in, in we talk about it in addiction and in, in suicidality, like there's a su- people can have a suicide part. Ultimately, what that part is trying to do is protect that person. It's just their last line of defense. So like even with addictions, they're trying to prevent that person from feeling something that was really awful. So like these parts, we have to thank them for doing their job because it's all they know how to do. And so when we, what they really want is to be heard, right? So like giving them that, that acknowledgement and letting them speak, because if you let your part speak, they'll tell you, and then thanking them for doing their job and then letting them know that you as self, they can trust you now that you got it. And they often don't even know how old you are. So it sounds funny to talk about it like, you know, different people, but yeah. the parts think you're the age that they developed. And because a lot of these parts developed when we're young, they think we're young. They don't recognize that, oh, we're adults now and we, we got this. And so it's how do you get them to trust you? Wow. That's beautiful. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I want to get um, onto a different topic um, and I want to talk about SSRIs. Mm-hmm. SSRIs are very normalized um, and there have been people who have been a little bit critical about what we do as, you know, having a podcast speaking about holistic ways of healing. Um, and the fact that we're talking about drugs and I kindly say on here that the SSRIs that they take are a form of drugs. Um, but I think that people often ketamine is legal, but I think, you know, with, mushrooms or MDMA, people often think that because it's illegal, it's immoral and something that is legal is moral. And oftentimes I, in my personal opinion, don't believe that those always coincide with each other, but that's the common theme. And so I just wanted to ask you your opinions on SSRIs. Is there a time and a place to use them? Um, Are they beneficial to take long term? I just want to know your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a complex subject, right? So when we, so also in there, you talk about kind of the term drug and the legal and illegal. Um, you know, I think what's really helpful for people read Carl Hart's stuff about um, drugs. I think drug for adults drug or for grown ups. I can't remember. This. Yeah, it's a great yeah. book. He, he's, an ama- he's an amazing human. He's been blowing um, our mind with the, his topics. Yeah. He's, he's so great. Yeah. Um, I had a chance to, to meet him, but, um, yeah, he's great human in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, yeah, the idea, I mean, you have to understand about why psychedelics are illegal, right. And like why certain things are legal and not legal. And there's a lot of politics and money behind all of that, but we have been taught to think that illegal is bad. Yeah. So legal is good. Um, now SSRIs, you know, when they came around, it was a huge thing in psychiatry because we didn't have, and I'm not even a psychiatrist, but I remember this in medical school. Um, we didn't have, they didn't have anything else really. 
So the fact that it helped people was huge because all they had was therapy and one people, most, a lot of people can't afford therapy and two, it, it has minimal value in certain places, depending on what's going on with people. Um, now, I think that there was probably overestimated how effective SSRIs were, but I still think they do help people. So I'm not anti SSRIs. I, I think how, well, most people believe that the idea of what we thought depression was, was like chemical imbalance and not enough serotonin is not actually correct. But um, some, some people, SSRIs save their lives. And I don't want to make that wrong because it's not. Um, and there are times there are people who should not do psychedelics. It's, they're not really for everybody. And there are times when we should not be doing psychedelics. So when people are really destabilized, SSRIs can potentially help somebody. Antipsychotics can potentially help somebody. Psychiatric medicine can really help somebody. And psychedelics probably won't help them in that state because it will, will further destabilize them. Um, and, you know, people will come to me wanting to get off SSRIs, doing ketamine to get off of it. And I want to reframe that for them because the goal isn't to come off your drugs. The goal is if you feel better and you still have to stay on your drugs, great, you feel better. If you feel better and you can lower your dose of drugs or come off, great. But, like, let's reframe what we're actually looking to do. So, you know, I, and, and it's tricky because, like, I, I, there's some people who are like, should I start this or should I come see you? And I'm like, well, what feels right for you? Right? So part of it is, like, how do we empower people to recognize that they actually can listen to the bodies, that they can make a decision about what they want to do and what they think is going to be right for them? And if it doesn't work, we can try something else. So I don't like to make, you know, do I think SSRIs are overprescribed and that people stay on them forever? Yes. Do I think that like probably the majority of the people treating mental health are primary care providers and they don't really have anything else to use? Yeah, because access to psychiatrists is hard and expensive. And um, so people, I think in general, I think doctors are doing the best they can with what they have and the knowledge they have. I don't think most of them are trying to be malintentioned. But yeah, it's hard for a primary care provider to follow up and make sure because I think that probably at some point people don't need to be on them forever, but they're hard to come off of. Um, I think ketamine can help there too. When people do want to come off, it can bridge that gap, right? So when they're not feeling great, when they're coming off, potentially ketamine can help bridge that. Uh, so I think I like to make things, do I wish that everybody didn't, can just feel good <laughs> and maybe do psychedelics? Sure, but I, I recognize that's not actually real. Um, so like, how do we give people options? And it's the same way of like, you know, a lot of people are anti bringing psychedelics into Western medicine, right? We, why should we be bringing this into a clinical space? And, you know, I don't think it should be one or the other. I think we should have both, right? Yes, we have to be aware of like what we're appropriating or stealing from cultures and there should be awareness and, and be careful around that and inviting in, um, that aspect of it. But I also recognize that like my mom's never going to go to the jungle in Peru and take ayahuasca from a shaman. Now, maybe she'd come to my office and take ketamine. She'd way more likely to do that than she's going to go into the jungle. And like, why do I have to make something wrong if it makes someone like the fact that some people feel safe in Western medicine doesn't make it wrong. So like, why don't we just give access in different ways? In, but keeping in mind that we should be respectful of what we're doing. So it's the same with like SSRI, like people should have options and it, they should be able to learn how to make a choice that's going to feel good for them as long as it's keeping them safe. Yeah. So with, uh, with ketamine, we never asked this before, but is that a contraindication for having treatments done is if you're on an SSRI, do you have to come off of them before doing ketamine? So that's the beauty of ketamine. You don't have to. So because ketamine doesn't predominantly work on the serotonin receptor, um, like a lot of other psychedelics, uh, you don't have to come off your SSRIs. There are, there are some medications that we will have people not take for about 24 hours because they can uh, potentially mitigate some of the effects of ketamine or potentiate them, but most of the medicines people can continue on. So that is a benefit over um, psilocybin and MDMA. Now, my feelings about the interactions between those are probably... Uh, we're probably a little bit more concerned about it than we need to be just from the way that biologically uh, psilocybin works in LSD is that they, it actually kind of acts as serotonin and works on the postsynaptic receptor. 
So it wouldn't make sense to me that if you're on an SSRI that it would increase your serotonin because it's not. So the risk of serotonin syndrome, which is why we have, where there's concern, I think is probably not a real risk. And we're seeing that with people microdosing, right? And some, they're starting to do some studies on SSRIs and psilocybin. It's probably not going to be the risk that we thought it was. MDMA is a little different because it works on a presynaptic neuron and releases serotonin. So potentially that could have more of a risk of serotonin syndrome. I was on a webinar a few months ago that was about um, how they are starting to recognize that SSRIs do have a place in psychedelics, um, you know, when needed, and they're starting to see that it really isn't as much of a risk, just what you were saying. It's not as much of a risk as we once thought it was, and in this um, webinar, I was, like, kind of going back on a lot of the things that I thought because I was like, you know... SSRIs are bad. They don't do anything. They're just masking or a Band-Aid to a problem. Why not fix the problem instead of numbing it? Um, and then through this webinar, I was learning that, you know, sometimes they're necessary to get people out of, of a very dark place so they can have some type of psychedelic experience coming from a good place and not going straight in being suicidal or having suicidal tendencies and then going straight into a trip, you know, possibly having a bad outcome. So uh, Mm -hmm. I also, we saw this study that came out, what, a couple of weeks ago, um, where I think it's been well known in uh, psychiatry for several, several years, but it's just now coming out that they are finding depression and anxiety is not a serotonin, uh, what is the word, like, deficiency or Thank like you. Uh, an imbalance. Yes. An imbalance, because that's kind of where the first time I was ever diagnosed with postpartum depression, you know, my OB who is not in this realm space was, it's okay. It's just a chemical imbalance. I was like, Oh, okay. Let's balance those chemicals. Then give me some chemicals to balance them. <laughs> I had no <laughs> idea that that, I mean, it kind of came to me after a few, after a while when I realized they weren't really doing what they were supposed to be doing for me. But, you know, there's that misconception. And I think that study that just came out, not a lot of people know about this. Like, it's not just a chemical imbalance. It's not a serotonin mm-hmm. deficiency. So while these medicines are giving you serotonin, that's not the cause. Yeah, and I think that we'll learn that it's probably more complex than we think. Um, because SSRIs do work for some people. And so it's like, why do they work for some people? What's, what are the different types of depression potentially, or why, like, what are the factors at play? And I think that, yeah, SSRIs do, like I said, it, some people need to be stabilized and not everybody is ready to do psychedelics, right? So when we talk about SSRIs kind of treating the symptoms and psychedelics, we're looking to get towards the root cause. Not everybody is ready to look at the root cause and m- they may never be ready. So like, anyone who comes to my office, I'm always in awe of those people because it's really brave. It's so much easier not to take a look at yourself. It's so much easier to mask the symptoms and go along with life. And that's what a lot of people do. It is challenging to take a look at what, what you're doing, why you're doing it, and then to figure out how do I change that? Like, wow, cool. That is really a brave decision. So um, I never try to convince anyone to do psychedelics or to do ketamine. They have to want to do that on their own because if they don't want to do it, they're not going to get out of it what they need to get out of it. Um, it's the same when people talk about ayahuasca. People always say, well, do you feel called to do it? And they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, okay, you don't. <laughs> so like, it's, it's just a knowing. Like, people will know. And yes, they can ask questions. And yes, I'm happy to talk about it. But I'm, I'm never going to try to convince someone that this is what they should do. What I was going to ask okay. is, you know, there are some people in my life who – take antidepressants as a way to not face things. Um, and I still notice that they're really struggling with everyday life. Um, Mm -hmm. is there a point where maybe SSRIs aren't right for somebody and they should go down, even if it's not psychedelics, go down another Avenue, um, that you would suggest 
Yeah, I, mean, I think, you know, at that point, if we're not doing therapy, therapy might help to get some insight, right, into really having them evaluate, are the SSRIs helping them? Do they feel better? Do they feel different? And if they don't, then do they want to? Yeah. Right? Some people get really attached to their diagnoses and their symptoms, and it becomes an identity. So yes. there can be a struggle when people start better that they don't know who that person is. And it actually can be very uncomfortable for them because all they know themselves as is this depressed person. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's again, you can't force or push anyone into anything, but it's like, how do you right. help them create some insight around what, what are, how do you actually feel? And what do you want to feel? Um, and are you willing to try something else if it's not working? So what does your clientele look like uh, age-wise? You know, do you see predominantly female, more male? Is it a, is it a good mix? Um, who typically comes to a place like that in LA? I'd love to know. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, I think it's been about 50, 50 male, female, they'll go in waves where I'll get like a bunch of new female clients or like then a bunch of male clients. But overall, I think it's probably pretty even as far as uh, sex, or gender, or whatever, however people identify, um, if they're identifying male or female. Um, age wise, I'd say predominantly, we're going to be like 30 to 50. But I've treated people in their 70s, and I've treated people in their 20s. Um, I don't treat adolescents. I know some people do. I think that probably should be done by psychiatrists, mm -hmm. um, just because there's probably an extra layer of support that they may need. Um, but yeah, I think that for me, particularly the, the people that I treat are very professional, high-functioning people that are going to be like, Old, like 30s, 40s, and both male and female. I, I get a lot of clients who refer other clients. So that's why they often end up being sort of similar because they're in their own network. Yeah. Um, but yeah. What's the um, most profound success story that you've had with ketamine that sticks out at the top of your head? I mean, I have one client who... Um, she's a very successful CEO um, and very was very good at control. Like that was very like presenting with masculine energy, very good at control. Um, even, and it's funny because people start to want to control parts of their journey. They'll come in and they're like, well, I want a different playlist next time. And I want this type of music and can we do this and this? And it's, I just, I laugh inside because I see it, right? Like I see what's happening and I'm like, sure. I, I have lots of playlists. We can change it. And, you know, I, I'll push back on some things just because you don't want them people to just be fully in control because it's the opposite of what they're trying to do. But you want them to be feel safe. So at about like the third session is when you see people really make that shift and they just like it's hard to explain, but they they're just softer and they open up and they like like when I even played the first playlist again, then she didn't know it. And she was like, Oh, I love that playlist. I'm like, that's the one you made me change. Uh, and she kind of left her, her work, her profession. She took like a sabbatical and she's like, I don't even, I can't understand this and why I want to be doing this. And really kind of went down a, a self healing journey for probably about a year and recently decided to go back into it. So she tends to step in as CEO for companies help them improve, save them, and then pass them back off to a new CEO. Um, and so she was doing that and she, she one recognized how she was showing up completely differently. So like the people around her were reflecting back about how she was different and she recognized how she didn't even want to do things the same way. And while it was a really good experience for her, she also realized that that's not where her purpose is. She's like, I know I'm really good at this, but this doesn't serve a purpose for me and that feels fulfilling. And so now she has clearer vision on what she wants to use her skills in. Um, and it sounds like, you know, it, well, where's the story that somebody was like suicidal and like no longer suicidal. It's not always like about making something bad, you know, that something was really awful for someone and now it's really good. It's that like people are really attached to their, to the way that they are. Right. And people are really rigid thinking and control. And if they can shift into completely different humans, 
like if you see people, they look different. To me, that's even like more profound because it's really hard to change who we are. Right. Um, so like it just sticks out in my mind because she literally was a completely different, it is a completely different person. Um, and you know, nobody's, these don't, psychedelics don't make things easy, right? They don't just take away things. What they do is they give you this ability to handle things easier, right? So like, we're going to go off track, we're going to get things wrong. And then we, we realize how we have more coping skills to get back on track. So it's not that she's perfect and that like nothing ever, she doesn't have the same, some, some same struggles. Um, but it's, it's just really, um, it's an honor to witness people's change. Yeah. I'm going to go off on a little side tangent here. Um, because this came up the Will Smith, the slap heard around the world, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and he wrote in his book that he's done ayahuasca, you know, 30 plus times or something crazy. And um, so many people are like, well, well I guess it didn't, I, yeah, I guess yeah. ayahuasca didn't work. So, but that's not how I saw it at all. I had an Uber driver telling me that he was just like, well, they obviously didn't work for him. And I was like, no, I think they, they did because he was able to take a step back and he wasn't blaming or projecting and he apologized and he stepped away from the Academy and he took accountability and he just recently came up with um, an apology. He did like a whole video on it and he was talking about how he's done a lot of self-reflection and what happened for him in that moment was a trigger that he's been working on. So I think with what you were saying, we're all human. We're all going to make mistakes, but this allows us to make them in a healthier way, I think. I think psychedelics can get us to a place where we recognize that we're allowed to make mistakes and we're allowed to learn and grow from them. And that's all you can do. No one's ever going to reach this level of perfection where they're not unintentionally hurting people. Um, It's what you do with that afterwards that I think makes the most difference in, in your character. Yeah, I mean, there's an acceptance, right? So we can accept that we did something that was potentially wrong. And it's also with psychedelics, you see humanity in everybody. And you recognize that we're actually all the same. So we're not separate. We're all the same. That's part of the whole interconnected. So you can allow forgiveness for self and for others and compassion, self-compassion and compassion for others. Now, you know, when we bring in the element of celebrity into the psychedelic world, I have a lot of... <laughs> Uh, feelings about that in general. Um, You know, I know a lot of people who ayahuasca is their medicine and they've worked with it thousands of times, but you wouldn't know that because they don't go around telling you how many times they did ayahuasca. So to me, there's an ego component to psychedelics that shows up as well. Like the more you do, the higher you do of doses, like the better it is. And I have, that's not coming from the right place for me. And, you know, it's cool to do psychedelics now, right? It's trendy. Yeah. And so people speaking about it, they're, they're getting something from that. And so like, I don't, every time I hear another celebrity endorse psychedelics, I, part of me cringes a bit um, because it's like, oh, because I see the commercialization happening, right? And we see the big money and the investors in the space. Um, so yeah, and that's, that's my own, that's my own stuff. But um, yeah, I think that, the medicines don't fix us one because we're not broken and two, because it's not about the medicine. It's a, it's again, the medicine doesn't give us anything and we will never be perfect. Nobody is ever perfect. So, you know, it's very easy for someone to then blame. Oh, like, Oh, this didn't work. Okay, cool. It's not really about that. And it's one you know, moment in his life. Do we know? I don't know. Will Smith. Does anyone like, so unless you know him, yeah, was it a, probably a poor decision at the moment? Sure. Should we be like attacking anybody? No. no. But, um, you know, as humans, we make judgments without knowing what's really going I on. I love that you said that's my own stuff with the celebrities because <laughs> I kind of see it as, um, and I see it, I have a different perception of it. I see it, you know, Aaron Rodgers coming out recently and saying he's done ayahuasca and a lot more people are like, because they have this attachment to celebrities, um, they're like, oh, maybe Leah and Christine are onto something. 
you know? So (laughs) I see it as like another way of people hearing about something that we're passionate about without feeling like we're just these hippy dippy moms who are (laughs) finding a hobby and doing something, you know, that's completely out of the norm. Some people think we've lost our minds. Oh, hundred (laughs) percent. But I'm okay with that because for my, for where I stand, if another celebrity comes out and has a good experience, I'm like, see, it's not just me, guys. Like yeah. people are doing this around the yeah. world. <laughs> I see the good and bad to it. I see the bad think, too. Yeah. 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 I think, you know, part of the problem is how we idolize celebrities. So that's, yes. Yes. that's you know, but I think so that's where my, you know, my cringiness comes from is that like, why is that the people that we we idolize and make it important, but, um, you know, and it's like Michael Pollan's book, right? So we can talk about how there's a lot of white males in psychedelics and leading the space. And now we have another white male that's like bringing psychedelics in, but you know, he reaches white males who will never do psychedelics, right. Who are a lot of the people in power. And so if he can make them listen, and if he brings it into the public forum in a more acceptable way, great. Um, so I think, yes, there is pros to it being more acceptable, but with that comes some negativity around the people who are, are bringing our pot- potential for, um, a downside. So like, you know, it's, there's this saying that like, we like, don't get ahead of the medicine. Yeah. Um, so when you're working with medicine, don't get ahead of the medicine. And so like part of what I, when I, when I hear that, and when I think about that, I feel like the space, like we're getting ahead of the medicine. Yeah. So I listened to a podcast episode with Carl Hart and he actually brought up Michael Pollan and how, um, him, Michael Pollan being a white male is now normalizing psychedelics for white males. But then he's like, well, I've been talking about this shit for a long time too. And Mm -hmm. how, um, he gets a lot of flack cause he, he, he really goes, deep into some, even some things where I'm like, whoa, I don't even know if I'm We weren't ready to hear (laughs) some of the stuff he had to say, but I'm open to it. I'm open to hearing it, but it's just, I haven't heard about it. So, um, and I'm speaking more about, um, him being vocal about his, his heroin use and using it in a controlled way where I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh yeah. The things he say breaks my brain as a physician. And, And I told him that I'm like, I'm like, you have the data and I believe what you're saying. I go, but it, it breaks my brain in a good way because of everything I've been taught And the hospital that I worked at in residency was a hospital that served a lot of heroin addicts. Right. And it's so hard for me to, but like, I, I actually believe him, but it's, it's like in too. a good way. Right. Like I feel it reversing like the stigma or the things that I believe about it. And that's why I think, and he's in it. It's so like, can you imagine how brave that is as, as a, a black man with like long dreads who's talking right. about his illegal drug use right? and how that significantly has changed his life and as a result he's in, the, in not a good way? He's the only one that I know who's been very vocal about it and, you know, um, and his career and his stature and it's all just kind of, yeah, we felt the yeah, same way. We were like, shit. like for days he's successful. He's texting each other like, yeah this is blowing my fucking mind. Yeah. This is insane. Yeah. 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 It's fucking wild. So yeah, it hurts your brain. Yeah. And in like a way that needs to be hurt. Right. And you know, with the Netflix documentary about how to change your mind, I was like, they had the potential to do something really great with that. And it felt like a lot of me watching Michael Pollan. And, um, I could have used a little bit more, um, diversity of people there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just so it didn't feel so much just like him. And yes, it's based on his books. But yeah, it's, you know, I think there's probably a lot of people who are ready to, to see other people than just old white men. Um, but as we like I said, there's a lot of old white men in power. <laughs> and but there's also if a lot we of can old white potentially men help shift it. those people. Yeah, exactly. So like if we can reach them in a way that maybe helps with some of their healing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I also think that there needs to be, um, you know, and there are starting to be more women in the psychedelic space. There needs to be more people of color in the psychedelic space. Um, and I think there are some organizations trying to do that. I think that we're probably still yeah, not doing it well say, because there's a, there's a lot of elements to that. 
Yeah. And like, you know, medicine and like people of color and, and traditionally there is not a good history there either. Um, and drugs and like people of color. So like there's a lot of layered elements right. to this that people don't want to necessarily talk about or look at. Um, but with the hopes that that potentially starts to shift, I don't know how long that will take. But That was going to be my next question is where you see this going. That's in exactly the next... what I was just going to ask. Oh, were we on the same page? Yes. Uh, <laughs> so I think this is happening very quickly. And I think this shift is happening in a way that I never would have thought to be something that I would see in my adulthood. Um, I don't know. I, I see this happening in a, on a very fast track to legalization, um, normalization, destigmatized. Where do you see this heading and how soon do you see all of these sh- changes happening? I think we honestly don't know. Um, I think there is a lot of, you know, excitement in the space about more people being aware of this work and believing in it. And I think that there is some fear for people who have been in this space for a really long time because of how fast it's moving. There is fear that that will then lead to some bad outcome that will make them quote unquote taken away again. Um, I think, you know, with legalization, that also adds a lot of, of potential worrisome elements, right? So if they become medically legal, uh, I think that they will become inaccessible to a lot of people cost-wise. And, you know, there's, farm, there's companies trying to develop drugs that are shorter acting, right? And there's a reason for that. It's not to make it easier for people. It's so that they can make money off of it because doing eight hour journeys in a clinic, you need a lot of staff because you could probably only sit with one or two of those a week and you could only do one person, you know, one a day. Uh, So that's very difficult to make money on. And so that's why they're creating shorter drugs. And anytime big business is involved in something, it makes me uh, hesitant. So I think we don't know where it's going. I think that we're unlikely to see federal legalization of like drugs, it, like we have seen in other other countries, um, because there's a large portion of our country that is probably anti that. Um, and I think because we don't know, there's a little bit of trepidation, and it feels fa- too fast. It feels too fast in some ways. Um, it's exciting and also feels a little like we're getting ahead of the medicine. Yeah. I read an article um, about how big pharma wasn't wanting to invest in psychedelics because they would lose money. (laughs) Um, And so a guy was working on formulating like synthetic psychedelics that people could take every day. So big pharma would invest in it. And I just wanted Mm -hmm. to ask you what your opinions are going that route because I don't know how I feel about that so there there's two things happening there are people creating shorter shorter acting drugs and there are people creating drugs that have the same effect um as psychedelics without the psychedelic experience and they're doing studies on whether the psychedelic experience is actually necessary um (laughs) I my belief is that we don't actually know how psychedelics do what they do right we know parts of how they do what they do I believe we're not truly meant to know all of it, right? It's the human aspect, the ego that wants to know it all. I think there's some element of like, how can we make these safe and and make sure that they're safe for everybody, but also like, we don't need to know all of it. I think that like, that's where we're losing the the sacredness, right? So there should be a reverence for these medicines or drugs. I'm not attached to the term. Um, There should be a reverence for what's happening. And you, we can use the word spirituality, but that's a very loaded term. I don't mean that in a religious way. I just mean that you believe in something bigger than yourself, whether that be connection to others, a God or whatever. There is a spirituality component with psychedelics. When we make them into just a drug and when we make it about the drug, we have lost what we're doing. Because then it's like, here is another pill. Why don't we just use SSRIs? Because it's just a pill you have to take every day. And then even when you microdose, right, should be intentionality around microdosing. We set intentions for that. Um, 
that's where a lot of benefit can come from. So it's not just about taking the pill every day. It's about why are you taking the pill every day? What are you coming to this for? What are you hoping to get out of it? What are you hoping to change? So when we, if we don't have the intention, the mindset, we're losing part of the element of psychedelics that makes them so effective, right? We're losing the set mindset. Right. And if we're not using the setting, we're losing the setting. And I think dose should be in there too. But so to me, we no longer are working in psychedelic medicine. We're working in pharmaceutical medicine. I agree with that. Yep. It's a little bit terrifying, but I also, it's so hard because I know so many people don't want to do the underground route. And I do think that it could help Mm -hmm. a lot of people, but I can see how for me doing them is almost like a remembering of how it's supposed to be and how we're supposed to be connected to nature. And then in the way that you're speaking, the way that pharmaceutical companies are coming in and swooping in, they're going right back away from the natural side of it. They're like, nope, we're not going to let you guys know that this can be done in your backyard. We're going to do it up here and we're going to make some money off of it. Mm -hmm. I see both sides. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit terrifying because while I want it to be out and I want information out there, I maybe the way that to go about it is to, to remind people that this is, um, you know, this is something that should be done with respect and with intention sacred. and it, and it should be considered sacred. Um, so maybe there's just something that we should talk about in that space where we can remember what it's for and how it came about. I don't know. I don't know how to. Fix yeah. And problem. I think, you know, I think bringing it into Western medicine, it will always be synthetic, right? So there has to be, there's FDA rules about like, do we know the purity of the drug and how much people are getting? So they won't ever get a, an actual mushroom. They will get pharmaceutical psilocybin. But we can still create a experience that allows for intention and, and allows for setting and allows for a reverent spiritual experience, whatever that is. Or um, it doesn't have to be about just taking the drug. Mm-hmm. And so I think that allows people the access to not have to go underground if that doesn't feel safe for them. But if we just prescribe drugs so for people to take them every day, we've lost that. That means a lot of people will be should not be serving medicine. And that gives the potential for more people to be taken advantage of and potentially for bad outcomes. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, even underground work can be quite pricey. Yeah. And then you can find people who are not pricey. To me, it's I'd be wary of the not pricey ones. <laughs> Um, Not that one means that they're good or bad, but, um, you know, the people that I, that I have come across who are really good at what they do, um, charge a good amount for it for good reason. But um, it's when you think about how much they're investing in their time and energy from like before to during to after, if you look at like per hour, it's not that much. So I get a little bit worried with the underground exploding and people saying like, oh, well, I did a mushroom experience. I can now sit for other people and serve and serve mushrooms. Oof, that makes me feel really uncomfortable yeah. and nervous. And so I think education about like, if you are going to go and sit with somebody and potentially not legal environment or underground, how do we educate people to do it in a safer way? What should you be asking that facilitator? Yeah. Yeah. Like how to find the ones that are right for you, where you feel safe, where you feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And Uh, what should they be asking you? Yeah. That's a good one. We should maybe do an episode on that soon. Yeah. I know you're in LA and you're about to be in Utah. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything, any services that you can offer to people who aren't in those cities? Like in Louisville, Kentucky. (laughs) Just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, medically, because doctors were, we can only practice in states that we're licensed in. Um, you know, I, unless people are in my state that I work, I can't work with medicine with them. I do offer integration services for people. Now, I'm not a therapist and I'm not offering therapy. I think integration and therapy are two separate things. Sometimes people need both and they can go well together, but they're not the same thing. Um, So yeah, if people have like had an experience where they didn't get enough integration or or need some support with integration that I do offer, um, or people looking to start ketamine practice, I offer consulting, having kind of been in this space for about three years now, 
Um, but yeah, unfortunately, the way medical systems are set up in this country, it's what if What if we come to you for a retreat? Yeah, so that is something that like, um, so I am starting with my, my partner in Utah. Um, part of what we're doing are going to be retreats. Um, I've just started doing group ketamine sessions specifically for healthcare providers here in LA, which will actually start this week. Um, Cause I think there's a lot of trauma that's happened there. Um, so yeah, tr- retreats will be happening. Trainings will be happening. So yeah, if you come to the state where I can practice, then yes. <laughs> okay. Can I ask you who your partner is? Uh, yeah, his name is uh, Bob Borelli. So he's a emergency medicine trained physician who is now trained in ketamine. Um, actually, he came to one of the trainings that I was helping facilitate. So uh, he lives in Park City. So that's why it works out very nicely because I just bought okay. a place in Salt Lake. So well, I, I asked because we're interviewing um, Sunny Strasberg. So oh, yeah. After you. Oh, she's in yeah. Utah? Okay. In, well, yeah. When, so ironically, I haven't met her. Yeah, I haven't met her yet. I know of her because we've trained through the same ketamine training. And actually, my friend who is doing a ketamine training here in LA that I'm uh, helping facilitate from the medical side, Sunny is going to be helping facilitate from the therapy side. So I will actually meet her in October. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Having like doctors and therapists and psychiatrists all in the same type of space because you guys know what's working. Yeah. Not, yeah. not everybody. And I think this but. work is meant to be done. In, no, not, not everybody. <laughs> but I think this work is really meant to be done in community. Yeah. Um, and I think it's been a little bit challenging because physicians traditionally kind of work solo. Therapists and psychiatrists traditionally work solo. And so getting people to kind of work together can sometimes be a bit challenging just because we're used to working in separate silos. Mm-hmm. But it really works well when there's a team. Um, because we bring different things to the table. And I think that really can make people like the, the clients that we're treating make them feel safer and give them access to different things because everybody needs something a little bit different. I love that. Go. <laughs> well, I was going to say, <laughs> so how, um, how can people find you? I found you on Instagram and I just mm-hmm. loved all of your content, but how can other people, our listeners find you? Yeah. So my Instagram, um, Stephanie Lynn Coleman, MD. Uh, also I have a website, website, uh, it's www.stephanielynnwellness.com. Um, those are the easiest ways. My email and phone number are both on those. Um, we don't have a website yet for our Utah business, so they can just reach out to me. Um, that's in, in process, but that business will be called journeys, journeys. So um, a little play on words, but, um, <laughs> and yeah, so that's probably the okay. easiest way. I love, that. I love your content, by the way, we shared something this morning, I think. So yeah, I know I follow both. <laughs> of you have accounts. a lot to offer, not just in, um, the medicine space, but on your Instagram as well through trauma and healing and yep. mental health. So we love that. Um, thank oh, you. Yeah, it's important. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing some time with us today. I know you're a busy woman and, and you've got a lot to offer. So I appreciate you sharing with us I and love our listeners. talking to a female doctor. I know, I know. <laughs> in this space. Yes, so. yes. If so, we're ever out yes, in LA, there's a few of us we'll, out there. We'll come, or Utah, we'll come give you a, a yeah. shout. Um, and to all of our listeners, uh, we hope you guys enjoyed this some new information even for us love that when that happens all these mind-blowing moments um and we will see you guys on the other side